Welcome everybody to today's event on Chan Silent Illumination and Mahamudra. So this is a discussion between two different Buddhist traditions. Uh, my name is Sara Khan. I am the assistant to Guo Gu and we are celebrating his release of the Silent Illumination book just released by Shambhala on Tuesday. And the Guya Samaja Center was generous enough to host this event as a dialogue between the two traditions discussing uh, the similarities and differences between Mahamudra and silent illumination. So first, uh, Guo Gu will do a short 10 minute introduction on silent illumination. Guo Gu is the founder of the Tallahassee Chan Center and of Dharma Relief, which is an inter-organization of different Buddhist traditions. Guogu is also an associate professor at Florida State University of Buddhist Studies. And after Guogu speaks for 10 minutes, uh, Dr. Lauren Ladner, who is the director of the Guya Samaja Center, will discuss for around 10 minutes as well, explaining Mahamudra. And Lauren Ladner is also an advisor to Dharma Relief. So very excited for everyone to be here. And a few notes for when the discussion opens up and there are any questions or answers, please type your question in the chat box in Zoom and we will try to address them as they come. Uh, first to last. So instead of unmuting yourself or raising your hand, please type your question in the chat box and we will read out those questions for Guogu and Lorne to answer. Okay, thank you all very much. And Guogu, please, uh, we would be happy to have you speak. Thank you, Sara. Thank you. I'm grateful for this opportunity for Guya Samaja Center to host this event, and for Lorne, uh, my friend, to be my conversation partner. Um, originally, Shambhala set up different book launches uh, to promote the book, and um, all this is very new to me, and uh, I would rather have a conversation instead of promoting, promoting a book, so I asked Lorne if he would be willing to share with me some of the teachings of Mahamudra, which I hear so much about, uh, so much similarities. So we'll see how that goes. But um, briefly about silent illumination, this is a tradition that um, you could say uh, dates back to the historical Buddha, but uh, articulated in a very Chinese way, uh, highlighting uh, particular qualities of mind. Uh, the most important um, proponent of uh, the silent illumination practice uh, was Chan Master Hong Zhi of the Southern Song Dynasty, 12th century China. And uh, the way he expressed this practice was really amplifying uh, the essence and function of the awakened mind and uh, how, how that relates to kind of daily activities and responses to circumstances. Right? So, uh, yet, this practice of silent illumination, when it was introduced to uh, Japan uh, through the Jap lens of Japanese Zen, became tied specifically to uh, some form of uh, practice. Right? Uh, and uh, later in the 18th century, it became um, kind of en enraptured, if you will, uh, through sectarian debates. So this book, uh, really what I wanted to do is to return to uh, Chan Master Hong Zhi's teaching, uh, free from kind of sectarian uh, 
divines or tied to a particular lineage of uh, practice, and just really talk about silent illumination uh, as the embodiment of awakening and how that relates to daily life. My teacher has uh, also published on uh, silent illumination, and so my book is really a tribute to him. Uh, gratitude for the teachings that I have received. Also address something that he did not address in his book. So complementing what he has said before. And that is um, uh, you know, after assisting him for about three decades and uh, kind of being on my own teaching for about a, a decade, I observed that, especially in the West, uh, people are so so much in their heads, uh, in the headspace. And uh, because the gift of the Dharma comes to us, you know, through teachings like this or people reading, so automatically they process it through their, you know, discursive thinking mind. And many people are kind of divorced or disassociated with uh, their bodies. So with this book, what I try to do is to uh, bring it back, to ground the silent illumination practice in the body right, as a foundation. Uh, so people are more congruent uh, with the practice and not leave the practice as a kind of cerebral, uh, abstracted um, exercise, privileging only the mind. Right? So I focus on uh, grounding the body through progressive relaxation. After gaining that foundation, uh, the, then a person will be able to access the subtle undercurrent tones, what I call it, uh, traditional Buddhist lingo would be uh, subtle uh, mental factors that's present. Uh, that shapes our perception, shapes our experience. So most people are not aware of this. So they just kind of plunge into the method, whatever method that, may, uh, that they may be doing, and just use it without uh, being aware of these undercurrent feeling tones that's actually shaping the way they're practicing. So. Once the person is relaxed, grounded, then this uh, undercurrent feeling tone will be able to be accessed. Right? Kind of framing that uh, mind state free from grasping and rejecting. Right? And uh, which is what I basically call contentment. Once the person is free from grasping, rejecting, contentment, cultivating this ability to be at ease, then you know, engage with the method proper. So the way I present silent illumination uh, is kind of rested on this foundation. So the body and mind and heart are integrated. Then one proceeds. Uh, to uh, deepen one's practice through uh, silent illumination. Now, I presented this basically as awakening. Right? And that's how Hong Zhi, Chan Master Hong Zhi, presented it. So, before one even gets to that right, uh, state, one has to have this foundation. Once the foundation is there, then, uh, how I link the, you know, presenting the thread that uh, connects practice and awakening is that the foundation of practice and uh, and one's understanding of it. And the, and the result, the thread that connects these three, 
is uh, what I call embodied experiencing. So this embodiment overcomes the problem of division between body and mind, you know, disassociation. And the experiencing, uh, I try to avoid uh, the traditional um, uh, Buddhist lingo, if you will, of clarity, of awareness, mindfulness. These terms are so overused that within the tradition and also becoming so popular in the new age sphere of uh, kind of pop culture that the meaning really the, the meaning of these terms loses its, its uh, traction if you will so instead of using them i speak about experiencing so it just says the i see the years here our being, the most natural, uncontrived state is kind of moment to moment to moment experiencing. Not so much focus on that which we experience, but the experiencing. And in that experiencing, there's already freshness and clarity. Even when the person engages in you know, uh, wandering thoughts, in meditation, thinking of this and that, even in the midst of the emergence of these thoughts and the you know sudden vanishment of these thoughts freshness is there so in the practice of silent illumination first one relaxes ground the body and being with the simplicity of sitting that is the body is sitting the mind is sitting in this moment rooted to earth so in that moment staying with the reality of this moment which happens to be sitting uh, and maintain that kind of wakefulness that wakefulness and in that wakeful fresh embodied experiencing there's already a silent aspect which is the emptiness, shunyata, that would be the traditional Buddhist lingo, and the illumination, which is the function of prajna. The natural function, quality of mind is wakeful, experiencing, uh, this uncontrived state. So of course we bring to meditation, a lot of people bring to meditation with a lot of baggage and discursive thinking and so on. So in the beginning stages, a person uh, simply learns to uh, do this progressive relaxation. Relax, yet wakeful. Wakeful, yet without discursive thinking. So continually coming back to the body, grounding, grounding, grounding. Okay. Uh, not commanding ourselves to relax, but somatically feeling very concretely the skin, the muscles, the tendons, kind of grounded, relaxing, relaxing. And then maybe use a method like the breath. But the way one meditates on meditation on the breath is different than you know, the uh, non-chan way. So the way one uses the breath is also somatically grounded. Focusing on the experiencing okay, and the rootedness of the body. So you can say that's a kind of crutch. It's a crutch temporarily resting the mind there okay, until the breath maybe uh, subsides, becomes subtle. But what connects, what's there, what's present, is still this experiencing. So the crutch may change. The expediencies may change. And what connects to all the different mental states, uh, insights, it's actually this freshness, experiencing. And, uh, and um, so the person goes from kind of scattered state to a concentrated, from a concentrated to a unified. 
and this unification, this oneness state, must be uh, shattered. Must be shattered. That's, that's the least uh, trace, the bit of the self-referentiality. Um, and there are kind of methods to um, do that. So. Um, So in this book, what I try to do is uh, pay respect to my teacher by complimenting some of the things that he has uh, left out, and that is how to work with the body. And uh, in his earlier writings on silent illumination, uh, how to work with the body and how to work with one's emotions, right? and which I uh, elaborate on these undercurrent feeling tones, right? to really expose that. And then we can kind of accept them and kind of work with them and then let go of them. Um, so that's, uh, that's the kind of gist of, gist of, of the book. Uh, so silent illumination uh, as the kind of natural uh, essence and function of mind. And silence will be the uh, shunyata, the emptiness aspect. Yet it's not a stagnant, dead emptiness. Right? It's able to respond to circumstances and people and things uh, in a in a non-self-referential way. So we call that wisdom. And uh, in our tradition, this wisdom is none other than compassion. So essence being wisdom, function being compassion. So I'll leave it here. Hopefully uh, we'll have some uh, good conversation. Thank you. So thank you. Maybe I'll start by saying actually just, uh, you know, the book just came out, Silent Illumination. Uh, there it is. I finished reading it last night, actually, really enjoyed it. Um, and one thing I'll say just as somebody who practices in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, a few things I shall say. One is uh, I found it helpful personally uh, to read it, partly, um, partly to help me understand uh, Chan and Zen better. But also it helped me understand my own practices and, and sometimes having that different use of language is really helpful to sort of look at the same territory in meditation, but having different language, different use of words um, and sitting with those words and sort of being with them, it helps you see something in a different way. Um, and then also for me, actually, I was realizing also in the, in the midst of the pandemic that reading the book was also very grounding and kind of uh, helped assuage some of my own uh, feelings about that too. So I, I recommend it as one point. And then actually I'm going to start to just I want to mention a couple of things that are not that are really I wasn't planning to say but that are that are struck me so I'll just say them briefly. One is um, you know Hugu mentioned his teacher and um, one thing that was really striking me that you know is in, the, in Mahamudra is that there is no practice of Mahamudra without uh, a teacher, right? and there is the and that one um, that the Mahamudra tradition is grounded in a kind of um, teacher to student relationship, uh, and that um, one studies, you know, Mahamudra with a teacher, but also at the beginning of each session, one thinks of one's teacher. Uh, one does a kind of in Tibetan tradition we call it Guru Yoga, uh, but remembers with gratitude one's teacher, uh, and that. So one thing is that, you know, so there is no practice of, of Mahamudra apart from that really, uh, is one point. That's the preliminary, but it's also the requirement in a way. It's, it's a psychological requirement, it's an inner requirement. There's also another kind of preliminary is there's no, I was thinking this also like, you know, there's no, from, from my perspective, there's no point in practicing Mahamudra without compassion. Uh, in other words, the the reason for practicing Mahamudra, the grounding of Mahamudra, the, the whole purpose is Mahayana 
is bodhicitta, is love, is compassion. And the third preliminary point I was going to mention, which I think relates to something I was just said, I was thinking about this. I was thinking like the, the Mahamudra tradition really began in India, of course. Um, and if you think about the Mahamudra tradition, the main masters of Mahamudra in India were wandering yogis, right? Who wandered in the, cave, in, uh, the woods. Uh, so I think, you know, from their perspective, I was thinking about this, there was not really a need to talk about grounding in the body. <laughs> you know, they weren't uh, uh, living the lives that many people today are living. And then if you think of the great masters of Tibet, the great Tibetan masters of Mahamudra, um, there was this whole ethos uh, from Milarepa, you know, the great Kagyu master on. I was just been reading lately the poems of uh, Shar Keldon Gyatso, a great Galugpa Mahasiddha in the Mahamudra tradition, and who, who, uh, who lived a few centuries later, but looked up to Milarepa and would go off to caves, you know, also, and wander in the Himalayas. So again, I was thinking, wow, there wasn't really a need to, to focus on the grounding in the body because they were living in, they were wandering around. He would, he would often talk about wandering through the free and easy wandering or something of that sort, you know, through the mountains. Um, and they would also talk about the need, the one last preliminary I'll mention was um, this idea that you also um, let go of what they call the eight worldly concerns. But so in other words, that, that as a preliminary to Mahamudra, one is not focused on one's self-promotion, on gain or loss, on status, on anything of that sort. Uh, you know, and, and without those, actually, I would say so, the other way, without all those preliminaries, really, there is none. Uh, Mahamudra is not, won't happen or won't be, be the practice. Um, and then I thought to actually uh, read a quote from Milarepa, um, because it really, for me, resonated in some ways with the use of language in silent illumination. And there's, I'll just read a brief one, but uh, this is Milarepa speak, uh, singing. Actually, he, he would sing spontaneously after his awakening. They say he would travel around and sing spontaneous songs. He would, he would meet a student and just spontaneously sing in response to that student's um, question. Actually, it's the same thing Shar Keldon Gyatso did. They both were like that. But uh, what Milarepa sang was, when I meditate on Mahamudra, I rest effortlessly in the state of actuality. I rest relaxedly within non-distraction. I rest luminously within emptiness. I rest consciously within bliss. I rest naturally within non-thought. I rest evenly within multiplicity. Um, it was actually reading Milarepa that got me interested. In, it was the reason I got interested in Tibetan Buddhism, to be honest. Um, it's quite a beautiful and very spontaneous and very responsive, you know. Um, so then uh, I thought to say, so what is Mahamudra, right? And so, uh, you know, the, actually the word itself, right? Uh, Maha means great and mudra has different meanings. It can mean like a gesture, but in this context, it's usually translated to mean seal. And the, uh, the King of Samadhi Sutra, the Maha, Samadhi Raja Sutra, you know, says, uh, what is mudra, the, the seal, what is the seal? It's, the seal is that which seals all phenomena, uh, you know, like a royal seal that's stamped. And it says that seal is emptiness. There is, there is no phenomena that goes beyond emptiness. And, um, and so a lot of the texts say, you know, so why is that great? It's great because when you realize it, you become liberated. Uh, when you realize the actual nature of phenomena, then you become naturally li uh, liberated. And, uh, There are a lot of things one could say, and I don't want to take up too much time. So maybe I'll just say a couple of brief things. Um, actually, maybe I'll say this. I'll jump jump ahead. Like, so, um, actually, so yeah, maybe I'll use that. So, uh, you know, the particular lineage of Mahamudra that I studied with my teacher and mainly practice came from the first Panchen Lama, Losen Choki Gelson. Uh, and it was an, they, they say he, he kind of had an oral lineage that combined, you know, so uh, maybe I should say that very briefly. In the Tibetan, you know, the various Tibetan traditions, and um, the Nyingma tradition mainly practices in this regard uh, Dzogchen, which I don't know a lot about, so I won't talk about it. <laughs> but, um, but then the, and then the Sakya tradition mainly practices Tantric Mahamudra. So their main, uh, they don't, they, uh, Sakya Pandita actually said that uh, he kind of only taught uh, Tantric Mahamudra, that tradition emphasizes uh, Vajrayana. And the Kagyu and Gluk patricians also teach Tantric Mahamudra, but um, but also assert a sutra Mahamudra, a, su a Mahamudra practice that's in accordance with the sutras. And that's what I'll kind of talk about today, um, or I'm talking about today. 
And uh, so in that practice, you know, one begins uh, with, as I said, you know, with all the preliminaries I just mentioned, and then one meditates, what they say is uh, you meditate on the nature of mind. Uh, and, and I, you know, which is the nature of experiencing, right? Um, and share a couple things briefly. Uh, so one thing, so the uh, first Panchen Lama, he had this kind of oral tradition that came down from Lama Tsongkhapa that combined uh, Tsongkhapa's own insights personally about Mahamudra with the Kagyu practices. And uh, I'll just share a quote, I wanna share two quotes from uh, Panchen Lama Lozen Chogi Gelson, who I have a deep love for. Um, one is he, he, here he says, um, he talks about how there were many traditions of Mahamudra in Tibet. And he says, from the point of view of individually ascribed names, there are numerous traditions. And then he mentions some, the simultaneously arising and merge, the amulet box, the possessing five, the six spheres of equal taste, the four syllables, the pacifier, uh, chud, the object to be cut off, zogchen, and the majamaka view, and so on. And then he, then he says an important line. He says, nevertheless, when scrutinized by a yogi, learned in scripture and logic and experienced in meditation, their definitive meanings are all seen to come to the same intended point. So there he's saying that, you know, there were, he's a non-sectarian teacher, right? So he was saying there are many traditions of Mahamudra existent in Tibet. And he says, you know, the words are different. Uh, some of the individual parts of the practice appear different. But he makes a point there. He says, if you're learned and also experienced in meditation, then you'll understand how they come to the same intended point. And yesterday I was contemplating that and I thought, well, sometime it'd be nice actually if we do a follow up to this someday, maybe where we actually practice together. Because I thought, you know, I was thinking, well, it, like I would like to be able to add Chan to that list actually, right? Where one could say, from my, from my perspective, right? From a, from a perspective grounded in practice as well as learning, one understands experientially how they come to the same point, not just intellectually. That's what, you know, so what did uh, Panchen Lama Lozin Choki Gelsen do? He went and did retreat on all these practices. You know, he did practice, he actually practiced them. And so he knew in his own experience how they come to the same intended uh, point. And one last point, because I don't want to, I want to have some time for dialogue. So one last point I'll mention is he also says something interesting that I just wanted to share. That's very, uh, uh, way, anyway, it, it is what he says. So he, he and it's a, describing practice. So he says, uh, he talks about uh, resting in the nature of mind. Uh, and doing so without too much looseness, without too much tightness, and how to sort of be present and, uh, and experience the nature of mind. Then he says, from cultivating such method methods as these, you experience the nature of the totally absorbed mind to be non-obstructed lucidity and clarity, not established as any form of physical phenomena. It is a bare absence, which is like space and allows anything to dawn and be vivid. Such nature of mind must in fact be seen straightforwardly with exceptional perception and cannot be verbally indicated or apprehended as this. Therefore, without such apprehension, settle in the fluid and flowing manner on whatever cognitive dawning arises. So he's describing this achievement of a kind of state, right? Where one is in a kind of um, a state of lucidity, luminosity. And then he says something intriguing and provocative, I think he says, uh, great meditators of Tibet are practically of a single opinion in proclaiming that this, what he just described, is the guideline indicating how to forge a state of Buddhahood. Be that as it may, I, Chogi Gelsen, say this is a wondrous, skillful means for beginners to accomplish the settling of their mind and is a way that leads you to recognize merely the conventional nature of mind that conceals something deeper. So he says something provocative and interesting there, which is you achieve this state, right, of unobstructed lucidity, of space-like clarity. And then he says, that's not the end point. That's just, that there's still, and what he's getting at there, I'll just conclude with this, but he's getting at there is that there's still a, a reification. There's still a grasping uh, at that point. At, at mind is existing intrinsically, uh, at a, a kind of grasping, at a, which becomes the basis for grasping at a self. And he's making this point that uh, that, that still leaves room for self-grasping, for self-referentiality, for um, which then continues our um, ignorance, continues our process of samsara. And so he makes this point that uh, that that's not an end point, 
that merely resting in that kind of space-like, uh, even one could say empty lucidity is not sufficient, that there has to be an, an, uh, a going beyond self and self-grasping completely. Uh, and that, and then he, he makes the clarification, he says, and that's the actual meaning of Mahamudra, uh, that going beyond uh, all self-grasping, even grasping at the nature of mind itself. So. I'll stop there so there's time for some back and forth, I think. Ah. A very interesting point because um, often people attach to the scenery of this path. Like if you're going from point A to point B, you know, all kinds of sceneries. And that's analogous to particular uh, ways of meditating. Different methods have different, it you know, takes different routes, and the sceneries are different. So sometimes people take these uh, altered states of consciousness, whatever and however clear they are, and luminous they may be, uh, in the Chan tradition, we just call that scenery. You know. So keep going. <laughs> right? The practice is uh, ceaseless, endless. And I gave an analogy in the book. Sometimes people get to the state of clarity and it seems like selfless state, so clear. And sometimes they can even come about suddenly. Right? So it seems like a kind of sudden insight. Yet, the self is still there. So it's very important to work with the teacher. Right? So I give an analogy of like polishing a window or just suddenly recognizing the clarity of the window. Right? Translucent. But the window is still there. <laughs> right? So what happens to clean windows? Uh, you know, birds, sometimes birds even get confused. They kind of run right into a window thinking that there's no window there, but something is there. And that's analogous to, you know, one may be fine in meditation, seated meditation, you know, have some powerful experience and so on. But the, but the real litmus test of whether self-referentiality is there or not, it's actually like whether the window is there or not. Now, the window may be completely clear, transparent, but the window is still there. Therefore, uh, it's completely different to having no window at all. On the appearance, superficially, it seems like oh, it's clear, it's as if it's not there. But actually the difference is night and day. So the clarity that one uh, gets as a kind of meditative state versus the natural functioning of, of one's mind. Right? Uh, free from self-reference, free from ignorance, greed, version. The difference is night and day. So uh, in the midst of daily, daily life, daily actions, encountering you know, criticism you know, or oppositions or challenges, that, that's like the birds flying around, right? See if they hit the, hit the window or not, right? So uh, You know, hence the importance of the tradition, the instruction, and as you say, you know, gratitude to one's teacher. You know, uh, without the three jewels and the instruction of the teacher and that uh, foundation of uh, that relationship there, it's very difficult to discern. You know, and, uh, you know, um, I must say, in, in the Chan Zen tradition, you know, past, present, probably the future, yeah, uh, there's always been uh, mistakes <coughs> in sanctifying a student's experience. You know, a teacher that's not, uh, that hasn't had genuine experience 
because of their teacher. So they sanctify states that are like what you describe, uh, Lauren. Uh, that and and what that text that you were uh, talking to, uh, sharing with us, this uh, premature state, and uh, so that is a problem. So a person actually, uh, when things are going well, it's fine, uh, but. Um, when the eight winds that you described, the eight winds blow, blows, you know, having, lacking, gaining, losing, fame, defamation, you know, you know that's like the birds. <laughs> so obviously, you know, self-referentially you know, comes out. And, uh, and the person can break precepts, you know, break precepts, which is, uh, and uh, harm, you know, students and so on. So that's a problem. You know, within the Chan Zen tradition, I'm sure in other you know, Buddhist traditions as well, and, and non-Buddhist traditions. So the preciousness of a teacher and the uh, clarity of the instructions and uh, one's understanding, you know, matched by experience. I like what what you said about uh, in the old days, uh, you know, these yogis don't need to ground their bodies, <laughs> right? uh, and they wander in the Himalayas. But um, in in modern day, you know, people just live so fragmented lives and you know, fragmented minds and disassociative with the bodies and how they actually feel. These undercurrent feeling tones. That's um, Occupy such a big portion of of the teachings. I feel. I don't know if your experience with that. <coughs> yeah, I I agree, and I think it's a unique challenge. I was thinking about that recently. Like it's a unique challenge of our time in general. And then I mean, even that we're doing this on Zoom, you know, it's like there's so many. And the, I don't know how that. I mean, I'm not sure how that even happened. You know, the uh, how we relate to our body when we're constantly engaging with technology uh, and how we engage in our practice when we're so often engaging in technology. Even retreats now are online, of course, because of the pandemic. And in one way, that's wonderful, but another way, it makes it quite different. Um, really is important, isn't it? I mean, so one more comment. I was thinking about what you just said, and I was thinking also, like, yeah, that if we're not aware of what our current underlying feeling tone you're putting, our mental factors are, if we're not aware of that and working, and or at least aware of it, then so there's a question, is it possible to practice dharma? Yeah. Because there are practice of dharma that's apart from knowing your own, being aware of what your own intention is in that moment. Yeah. Well, the, the thing is, you know, what I find is just start practicing. <laughs> Just start practicing. You know, it's not like uh, if we're not aware, then we then we can't practice, because the level of you know, I, I often frame it in terms of exposing, embracing, you know, working with, and then letting go. Right. So this process of exposing, you know, we can only be aware of what we can be aware of, and then the more we are aware of through Dharma practice, the more things we discover, right? And then we can embrace, because there's always a history to why we are the way we are, as you know. Yeah. Um, so it's not a linear process, you know, first expose, then embrace, and then transform, and then let go. It's not that simple. It's kind of reciprocal, circular. You know, the more we expose, you know, the more we able to kind of work with them. The more we work with them, we discover more things. And so I usually just suggest people just start. Start with a teacher. It doesn't matter what teacher. <laughs> start with a teacher. Practice meditation. Give some instructions. And, uh, and then through practice, we'll be able to uh, expose certain things uh, within ourselves. And we can observe the teacher, you know, start to build that relationship. Uh, the 
congruence of that teacher, you know, the way the person speaks and that teacher's actions, whether they're congruent or not, whether they understand Buddha Dharma. You know. So the most people begin not understanding Buddha Dharma, which is fine, you know, just begin somewhere. Right. I'm sure that's your experience too. One question I wanted to just raise, one thing I, thought I found intriguing in the book was, and I mentioned this the other day to you, is, uh, is your use at, at times of Yogacara or, or Chinamatra of mind only uh, uh, perspective to, uh, to expl explicate Chan in some ways? I just wonder if you could say a little bit about that for people, because uh, I found it quite in interesting. And it was the first time I personally had seen that. There's no homogenized kind of Chan tradition, right? So they are just different teachers. And there are no like Chan teachers, right? They're just teachers, they're just practitioners, right? So different practitioners, and you see this in history, different Chan teachers, practitioners, uh, you know, through their own kind of karmic affinity with different teachings, some of them really are like um, Madhyamikans, right? The, what I call kind of closet Madhyamika teaching, you know, dressed in Chan. And some of them are, um, you know, clearly Tathagata Garba, you know. Uh, so some of the teachings that they espouse seems like it's almost suggesting something, like, like, like a reified thing, like Buddha nature or, you know, by the language that they use. Of course, when you, you know, read it more carefully and experience, and uh, you will see that, you know, Tathagata Garba basically is Shunyata, right? And Shunyata's functions, you know, luminosity and you know, so on. So, but the language can be misleading. And some teachers, <coughs> the way they explain Chan, you know, in, in, in the past, these historical, great um, practitioners really has this flavor of uh, you know the constructiveness of mind and, and the experiences so my teacher I would say <coughs> is one of those closets Madhyamika teachers <laughs> right it's particularly Prasangika as far as I understand it, like no position at all, not try to posit anything, you know. But he came up with all these expedient means, so he was very skillful. Right? And uh, having studied with him so long, I'm kind of like that too. But I find that the Yogacara teachings, you know, the mental factors and the epistemological explanation of how we come to know things are quite useful for the West. So people like to know how things work, like mechanically. You know, the first thing when, the, uh, when, when, when Western science approach Buddhist meditation is, what do they do? They put wires on people's brains and try to measure like how things are, are working, right? So in the West, um, people like to know how things actually work, how the mind unfolds, how does it function? So, for that reason, I draw on Yogacara, mm. yeah. uh, just because the way it explicates, you know, um, to have some kind of reference, you know, all the <coughs> uh, six mental uh, factors that's unwholesome, you know, uh, 11 wholesome one, 20, 20 subsidiary uh, vexations, you know, mental frictions. So, so people have some kind of map, right? So they can begin the process of exposing what is actually these undercurrents. Right? So, I, so people seem to find it um, helpful. And then in this book, I don't really focus on mental factors, but I focus on a, a unique practice called direct contemplation um, in Chan, uh, which is
which is a practice usually dealing with sight and sound. Uh, experiencing, again, focus on the embodied experiencing. Experiencing uh, sight and sound without so much clutter, without our uh, ruminations and particularly labels and discriminations, categories that we we impute on uh, people and things around us. So, so I used um, Yogacara's teachings uh, from from the Chinese tra tradition on valid perception to kind of explain that to provide some kind of uh, theoretical foundation in that you know, how uh, how we perceive things uh, through our sense faculties and uh, you know the first five and then the sixth one and uh, what is the kind of um, yogic valid perception right the awakened state so that people have some kind of framework, they know how things work before they dive in to it. You know, so, so I find that it's useful to to explain. And and and, and by the way, the reason we focus on uh, sight and sound is because so much of our vexations actually come from, you know, what we hear other people say to us, or you know, and then what we see, what's going on. So these two sense faculties uh, are kind of windows that generate all kinds of klesha, you know, relaxation. So it's really important to work with these two. So, so um, I wouldn't call myself a kind of closet yoga charm, but but um, but uh, just I feel that uh, my students need some framework. And this is not a typical, uh, historically, typical kind of Chan master would resort to this. They may say things in general about the constructiveness of mind, but they wouldn't typically go to the mental factors or, or um, explaining how, how things work. But the, in our current paradigm, um, 21st century, I, I, I feel it's, it's quite useful. So that's why I use it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Guogu, and I just want to do a time check that we have about 10 minutes left to this event, just to be mindful of your all's um, schedule. And one question that has not been addressed yet was by Frank Lusby. He asks, what role does analytical meditation into emptiness play in the Chan tradition? Tsongkhapa makes the point that without extensive analytical analysis into emptiness, one cannot get to the root of ignorance and how the world exists. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. So Chan tradition, as I, as I see it, cannot stand alone as a tradition. And historically, has never stood separate from Buddha Dharma. And it was a clerical, monastic tradition. So you're talking about people that study Buddha Dharma, the scriptures, the, the foundation, theoretical underpinnings of Madhyamaka teaching, Yogacara, and so on. And the Chinese tradition of Hua Yan and Tian Tai, which really synthesized the Indian um, Buddhist the great traditions. So you're talking really about practitioners who are very well versed in that. And if you look at the uh, particular key influential Chan teachers, what they did before, then you see that they are commentators or uh, scriptural exegetes of Vinaya of Diamond Sutra, which is Prajna Paramita, genre of uh, Mahayana text. So, so that's, that's the background, right? So that's the foundation. Um, 
and which involves conceptually understanding. So with that foundation, Chan emerged as a self-conscious tradition. Right? Now, granted, analytical meditation uh, really has no place in the Chan tradition. Why? Because the Chan tradition is based on Chinese Mahayana tradition, which they've, the practitioners have done that, and have studied that. So if you just look at the uh, part of the Buddhist canon, the East Asian Buddhist canon on the Chan teachings, you can't find that. But you really have to understand that from the historical perspective uh, of, of um, the larger East Asian or Chinese Buddhist tradition. Okay. So that would be my response. Uh, so, um, you know, part of our training, you know, of course we study the sutras, the treatises, and, and so on. But how Zen has been introduced to the West took a different route, took a different route. Um, um, and um, in pre-modern time, we see that Japanese Zen teachers also versed, well-versed in the Mahayana tradition. Uh, it's just that in the modern time, 20th century, how it kind of came through uh, the, the, the West, was presented in a particular way that seems like it's divorced from the larger richness of the Buddhist tra tradition. Right, so, uh, but um, the foundation of understanding emptiness conceptually and uh, understanding the uh, stages of practice is, uh, is the foundation of Chan. Any other questions, um, please feel free to type them in the chat. Uh, a concrete question about the actual practice of Mahamudra. How does one actually begin? You know, on the basis of you know, gratitude to teachers and understanding the tradition, but uh, how does one actually meditate? Would you please expand on that? Thank you. Sure. <coughs> Ordinarily, uh, for like a, uh, actually really, if you get into like the, for an actual meditation session, uh, one would usually begin with, um, actually, when usually one begins with a little bit of practice uh, uh, that's not uh, directly Mahamudra, but some like uh, Guru Yoga, uh, they would call it. So actually thinking of one's teacher in a pure form, usually uh, doing some kind of purification, uh, karma, you know, thinking about karma, doing some purification, uh, something maybe to accumulate positive karma as well, some offering, something like that. Uh, and then the ordinary actual beginning of practice actually in the way I, at least in the tradition I've learned it, is so, you know, uh, one actually would be doing the guru yoga though, right before one starts. And the, uh, one imagines one's guru dissolving into oneself. And then one focuses on uh, in the moment, present experience, and nature of mind. Uh, and, and the idea there is that one really focus, they, they sometimes say one focuses on, at the beginning one focuses on, um, the way I was taught it, it the one focuses on um, they sometimes they, there are different words they use to describe the experience, but some sense of uh, uh, clarity and awareness, some sense of, of uh, unobstructedness and knowing the knowing nature of mind itself, uh, what you were calling experience the experiencer in a sense you could say, 
and so you know when and then there's a whole there are many methods uh, that are taught because what happens of course is that then um, you know uh, anybody who starts notices that thoughts arise uh, feelings arise uh, their emotions uh, cognitions all of that and there you know there are many different actually there in the way the pension lama teaches it you know if one can just rest in a sort of vivid awareness of that clarity and knowing, which he says is for beginners, but that's the beginning point, then one rests in that. Um, and then usually he, he uses one metaphor, for example, he says, you know, when discursive thinking arises, he, he uses this metaphor, he says, it's like a crow on a boat far out at sea. Uh, when a crow far on a boat far out at sea leaves the boat, it has to come back to the boat because there's no place else to land. And he says, thoughts are like that. They arise from the mind and they have to land back in the mind. So just observe them and you'll see that. And they use other metaphors like the wave and the ocean, typical one. Um, you know, it's not separate from the mind. It is, you know, uh, it's the nature of mind and it's, uh, it doesn't separate from the mind. So one, sort of, one method he, he describes, which is often used is like that. So one just sort of observes thoughts and feelings as they arise. Um, and keeps one's main attention on the awareness itself or the clarity or the, the different terms for the same thing, but uh, you know, that, that quality of lumin luminosity, another way of putting it. Um, and so for a lot, and the way he teaches it, for a long while one's practice stays, you know, that one, one gets better and better at, at sort of being present in that way. Um, and then he describes another process though. So I'll just describe it briefly. So the, the main, you know, if you look at it from a practice perspective, that's the main practice for a long while. Then he says at a certain point when one has achieved a certain level of stability in that, he uses a metaphor, which I think is quite uh, helpful. I found helpful at times where he says, you know, I always remember this time when I was many years ago in the Canadian Rockies and I woke up early and there, there was a pristine lake, mountain lake, with no ripples, you know, completely reflecting the um, mountains. And he says, when your mind is like that, he says, then be, he says, use a tiny piece of your mind, have a tiny piece of your mind be like a um, very small fish under the surface of that lake that never disturbs the lake, but can at that point, he says, you use a, a, a small part of your mind to then, and this is what that questioner was getting at, to reflect on emptiness. To actually, uh, in that case, use majamaka reasoning to recognize that the mind itself is empty of any intrinsic nature, and, he, and the self is, uh, and the person is empty of the self. And he says, when you have that, and he, I, the point that the masters make is that when you have that kind of already resting in the nature of spacious, space-like, open clarity, uh, luminosity, then it's much easier to realize the view of emptiness. So he says, with that tiny quarter of your mind, analyze the ultimate nature of things and realize selflessness or emptiness. Uh, and then he says, and then that's, that's the actual, and, and that's his point. He says, that's the actual experience of Mahamudra when you realize that. So the other, that's where he's getting at, where he's saying the first part where you're just focusing on the kind of clarity, um, luminosity, awareness, he calls that a preliminary in a sense. Although one could do that preliminary for many years. Uh, and he says, only when you get to that state of pristine, kind of uh, like the mountain lake, he says, then you do this, uh, you bring back what you've already studied, of course, previously, which is the, uh, in this case, Majamaka reasoning to analyze the nature of mind itself, to realize emptiness. And then that's, and then he says, then that recognition, that experience of emptiness at that point is a kind of, it, it, he would say, is the actual uh, Mahamudra. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. When I listen to you, it sounds to me the clarity and the spaciousness is really just shamatha practice. That's right. And then the insight uh, is the um, the pashana. Right? Mm -hmm. So my my follow up question, I wish we had raised this earlier, because <laughs> this is the heart of it, right? So that corner of your mind that recognizes the nature of this uh, lucid, translucent 
calm state, as empty itself. Does it mean that the person actually generates, however subtle, a kind of analytical meditation? So is there a discursiveness involved in analyzing the emptiness? Yeah, yeah, I would say at that point, there's a, you, you say it's a very subtle level of discursive, if it is discursive. And the, the idea is that, um, you know, there's a saying that Tsongkhapa uses where he says, uh, not seeing is the supreme seeing or not finding is the supreme finding. So the idea is that at that point, there would be a, a kind of subtle discursive thinking, mm -hmm. which then uh, ends in a non-discursive state. Uh, so in other words, there is a kind of discursiveness at that point, uh, which then uh, concludes in a recognition of a, what they call a non philosophically we call it a non-affirming negation. You know, kind of a negation of self. And then at that point, uh, one rests in kind of non-discursive state. Uh, so, yeah, mm -hmm. but there is a, a point of discursiveness at that point. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think this is the different point between uh, the Chan tradition. Because one has established a foundation, you know, and thinking, um, understanding properly, emptiness. So, well, there are two actually distinctions, I would say. So the first part, the shamatha part, Chan tradition really dismisses the kind of shamatha practice that's just sitting there like a stagnant piece of wood, not moving. So Chan really, really uh, debunks that kind, the kind of stagnant state. So the kind of freshness and the experiencing that I'm referring to it's actually trained in the midst of daily activities. Uh, so vexations that will arise. In that freshness, which is just my way of saying emptiness, you know, how um, the insubstantiality of uh, thoughts when they arise, even wandering thoughts, right? That kind of suddenness, where does it come from? Where does it go? That kind of vacant, uh, insubstantial, yet fresh quality. In, in other words, the function of the of the um, the natural freedom of the mind, if you will. Uh, so, of course, you know, one first training shamatha, you know, do the meditation on, on the breath and, and so on. But um, there's a transition which a person, the way one practices sign illumination. It's actually in the midst of daily life. So not distinguishing between sitting meditation, you know, formal shamatha, and life, the complexity of life. Right? And always uh, kind of ground in the body. So the practitioner in the midst of daily life, they learn to integrate, you know, becoming very solid, very grounded, embodied. And learn to recognize when they talk to people, when they engage in different things and different challenges come, you know, to recognize that, I guess, emptiness, you know, that freshness. Um, you know, sometimes the way I explain emptiness and impermanence as emptiness as relationships, impermanence as just new beginnings. So really learn to embody this. So actually, the view is embodied. Um, so so that, that, that would be the, so the, the first part, what I would say would be the, um, the first difference, the dismissing of, you know, kind of deadening type of shamatha practice. And the second difference is, because the person has embodied, uh, kind of trained to embody in the midst of chaos, in the midst of daily life, this non-abiding um, freshness. Therefore, it becomes embodied. The view actually becomes embodied. So the catalyst, the catalyst from, you know, scattered mind, concentrated mind, unified mind, shamatha, to no mind, no self-referential mind, the catalyst 
in the Chan tradition is not um, discursive or analytical. So the catalyst becomes, and here's the importance of um, the role of the teacher and, uh, and the way one has embodied this um, freshness. So something occurs, either the teacher's action suddenly kind of pressuring the student by, you know, um, maybe some exaggerated form, uh, slap him across the face or, you know, like asking him a, a very, you know, acute question or just some gesture. Or by the student's own merit, good fortune, good karma, that that freshness one bypasses the uh, discursiveness suddenly through some, you know, just seeing something or hearing something. Um, and that's why that direct contemplation practice is so important, kind of supports the silent illumination. Suddenly the self drops away. Suddenly, uh, you know, one recognizes like the uh, um, selflessness. You know. So these two distinctions, I think, is, is um, quite interesting. Now, I did read Melorepa uh, probably 30 years ago. <laughs> but I remember something that he says and things that he would do to his student really sounds like, I mean, really reads like what Chan Master would do. Like, student have a question, when the student's ready, he would suddenly say something, and the student just pa drops away, and that's that's what I'm talking about. So he actually kind of bypasses this, um, you know, willful discernment of the mind. Does that make sense? I don't know if we have time for you to <laughs> to respond, but well. I'll say it's actually eight minutes past, and um, I think this is a pretty natural place to stop. And if there's more interest in a second dialogue, maybe we could arrange something. I'm not sure. And there are a lot of questions, so we'll save them for the future as well, if that happens. And thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you for the Shambhala Publications for making this event happen as well. Um, and we hope to see everyone again and please stay safe and thank you everyone.